Everybody seeing us okay? Yeah. Zoom. Brilliant. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much. That's been such a tricky start to this, but we're going to make it much easier from here on in. So this is it's great to be here on National Tree Week. Um, we are pocket forests. And thank you to Jeanette for setting this up. Um, and I took over. You were no, no, to say all that. No, 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 you just keep going. <laughs> this so, is Catherine Cleary. I'm Catherine Cleary. This is Ashana <laughs> Jones. <laughs> <laughs> and my name is Amy van den Broek and we're at Pocket Forest. Um, well, you're all very welcome. Um, so we're going to hopefully relax everybody. Um, this is a quote from a Japanese scientist. He's an expert in forest bathing, a, a practice they do. They take very seriously in Japan. And um, I think it's something that uh, this time two years ago when the pandemic hit, um, the one of the uni almost universal responses from a lot of people was to go to nature, whether it was to a park or to a forest or to a beach, depending on how lucky they were. And we realized there was a lot of inequality in access to nature. Um, we particularly felt that in our own neighborhood and that really sparked uh, pocket forests and, and how we began to uh, put things together. Um, the World Health Organization has a recommendation that everybody uh, has access to nine square meters of um, green space per person. So you can work out in your area whether your green space allocated is is good or not and the world it's a health recommendation because they now realize that our health our well-being our physical and mental health are connected intrinsically to nature and access to that so that's really where we um where we kick off from um this is a site in uh, in a in a town in ireland um that we encountered we we didn't plant a pocket forest right here but there are many sites just very similar to this, that where nature is trying to push through um, uh, intervention from humans by cut, trying to block it. So you can see the ivy and you can see the grass coming through. And um, we want to give nature a bit of a helping hand by introducing biodiversity. And we started this because we live in an area of Dublin, in Dublin 8, it's called, it's, uh, our area is called the Tenters. And we have the lowest amount of green space per, per capita. So we have about less than a square meter per person because it's so densely populated. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of problems with deprivation and uh, uh, in the community. So the, we we feel that 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 those two things are very much linked. So uh, we feel that pocket forest might be able to uh, this this kind of sparked for us the the um, the reason why we started pocket forest. So there were there are three pillars to pocket forests, um, and the first is using nature, native sorry native trees and shrubs. Uh, there, these are the these are the plants that um, that all our native insects and birds have um, developed with, and so that's that's what they need in, in abundance to keep surviving as well healthy forests have a variety of species so we always aim to plant as many different trees and shrubs as possible and we plant them together um, closely uh, um, min, a maximum of 30 centimeters um, per, per uh, gap per tree um, and and we it's this is that is adapted from the Milwaukee method and also uh, how a forest would grow naturally. Um, we want to bring these green spaces to towns and cities to reconnect people to nature. Trees and forest habitats clean the air we breathe and can help reduce flooding and produce cool sanctuaries for animals and people. And thirdly, the community investment is central to what we do. Um, we, we've seen again and again by people investing the time and effort um, into creating these pocket forests that it really establishes a, a very deep connection um, with the forest, between the community and the forest. Um, and it really gives people a sense of pride and joy. So where did pocket forests come from or where did this idea of tiny urban forests come from? There was a, a, a... Japanese botanist in the 1970s called Akira Miyawaki. He died just last year, he was 93. Um, and he was fascinated by forests because he looked at how healthy they were and he looked at the different complexities of them. And he came up with a method of, of planting them all in one go. So rather than just allowing the trees to develop over decades or centuries, he would actually look at 
the ground layer, the shrub layer, a, a lower canopy layer and a higher canopy layer, and he would plant them in one go. And they became a really um, beautiful way for him to bring the forest that he really loved into the cities where the majority of people were living in Japan. Um, 30 years later, there was an, an Indian car engineer in a Toyota factory and uh, the Miyawaki method was being used to make a forest in the grounds of the factory. And he fell in love with the idea and he finessed it even further and put it together as a very simple set of instructions on how you do this. Um, and he called his method the tiny forest. And then in 2015, those tiny forests began to uh, come to Europe uh, with a Dutch group who started the first one. That's one that was built in a Dutch city. As you can see, it's a really um, hard paved area. And then there's just suddenly this kind of almost like a pop-up book. There's this beautiful burst of, uh, of forest and it's all native and it's incredible biodiversity and healthy habitat for, for humans and for insects and animals. So that's where the, the tiny forest model came from. So this is <laughs> us. <laughs> we, are, we are very good with trees, not so good with technology or selfies. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm actually I'm the one with the bear hat on. And I was working um, in event design when I first came across the tiny forest method. Um, and being locked down in, the, in a 2K zone in Dublin's inner city was at the start of the term pandemic was uh life-changing for me to say the least um again as amy said we have the least amount of uh green space per person in ireland so tiny forest model just seemed like a um great solution to our problem and i'm catherine cleary i was working as a journalist and i've been writing about the environment and food for a long time uh, and also battling to hold on to an allotment uh, that we were working on in this part of the city. So when Ash told me about this tiny forest idea, it just seemed like a real solution to a lot of problems. Hi, my name is Amy and I am, uh, these are these are the two founders of Pocket Forest and I came on board this year. Uh, I worked in a, a social enterprise in Dublin and um, I, I'm from a food background, so organic food. And uh, when Ash and Catherine needed an extra uh, hand, I helped, I stopped, stepped in and it was great. Uh, it's a great opportunity and it's made me already so much happier. <laughs> Part of this evening when it gets <laughs> so stressful. <laughs> this, is, this is where it gets real. <laughs> so the great thing about our method is that our smallest forest can fit into the size of a car parking space. Um, so that makes it very doable for many parts in uh, any city, especially those unusual kind of unused pockets that we often see around cities. Um, uh, and it also <clears throat> within that small area, we plant 11 different species, which means we bring bags of biodiversity to that tiny area. Um, and within in just two planting seasons we've planted more than 40 sites around Ireland ranging in size from the yes. smallest there's our oh, there's sorry. our there's our location map um so it's hard to see because most of the pocket forests are in or around Dublin but we have around 40 uh, locations um we have some in the, a lot of them in schools or in uh, community center grants of community centers um tiny towns we worked with the GAA and we have to, we got access to some of the GAA grants they got a pocket forest so it's been uh, um, it's very varied but we try was, uh, as Catherine said we work with community organizations so it is a, a, a uh, it's broad there are different um, groups they can be children they can be uh, men sheds they can be elderly it's a, we've had everyone um, help create pocket forest so far um, here, we're going to go through a few of our projects that we've been doing. Um, we were lucky enough to work with four fire stations in County Kildare. And this is a really great uh, example of um, just the unusual places where we can plant um, our pocket forests. This was a really unused space in front of the fire station. Um, and that it had been cleared, it had... Um, it had a weed barrier we had to break through and um and now we've we've um 
created this the little pocket of biodiversity within a kind of dead space. And I have to mention, I also got to water this fire, <laughs> water with a fire hose. <laughs> I meant to put that picture in. We have a great picture of that. Um, I'll send it on to Jeanette with the fire hose. Um, it is a brilliant way to water the ground. Um, it's a huge thrill to get a go of fire hose. Um, as Amy was saying, we also worked with the GAA with several clubs around the country. And this is this this picture always makes me smile a bit because it, it we spent a good hour and a half preparing the ground here in what looks like the middle of a field. Um, but actually, just to the right of that picture is is quite a mature hedgerow. So it was kind of a little continuation of that hedgerow. Um, and into that space, uh, although we describe it as being like a car park space, we never make it look, we never make it uh, rectangle. It, we actually like to make them leaf shaped. So these six square meter forests have been leaf shaped in this project. Um, and it's been a wonderful way to talk to people uh, in rural Ireland about, we've been really impressed with what the GA is doing with areas around their pitches where they're taking out Leylandii hedges and replacing them with native hedgerows. <coughs> They're uh, seeding wildflowers around the edges. So there's great work happening and it's a brilliant way for us to see that when we go around the country. Um, here we will work with St Francis Hospice in Blanchetown. This is a really special project for us because um, it really highlighted um, what we're trying um, to communicate the healing power of planting trees and um, being able to nurture those. Um, we were asked to actually place this forest near the area where the bereaved families come and so it would be um, easily visible and accessible to them so it was really it's really lovely to know that this little forest is going to be helping some people heal uh, and then this is holly park school in black rock where we had a very enthusiastic bunch of young boys who uh, got to really love worms. <laughs> uh, it was really eye-opening to how um, how quickly these kids um, just fall in love with the earth and all the joys that it brings digging around in it. Sorry. Um, and then this was a, a quite a different school compared to the Black Rock School, where they already had quite a lot of even mature trees and, and for almost foresty areas. This is our most local secondary school. And on first glance, when you go in, it's just tarmac and graveled areas. There's hardly any space. But we this is actually our second forest in this school. Um, you'll see our first one later on in the slides. And it, it really does show how that model can fit into these spaces that people don't really see as having any use other than as you can see, there's a lot of weed barrier there, just a, a space that nobody really wants to maintain. So once the trees are in there, there's very little work to do with them, but you, you get a massive increase in connections. Um, this is a school where a lot of the girls who live there don't have any green space and have never done any gardening. So they got such a huge kick and they got such pride out of making that space. Um, and then sometimes, there isn't access to any soil at all. Um, we uh, entered into a partnership with the Digital Hub where um, they really wanted us to plant a pocket forest, but they had no access to any soil. So we came up with the idea of using an apocalyptic skip and um, um, to use it so almost like a, a giant, giant plant pot. And uh, this is, so obviously um, we had to do something to improve it. So we had to swap our spades for power tools and we had to <laughs> sand it down, buff it up. We built uh, a seat at the end of it so that um, eventually when the trees grow up, people can sit underneath them and uh, we painted it a lovely gold. And, and then we, we added. So what we were trying to do was recreate, and it's what we tried to do in, in soil as well, is recreate the conditions of a forest floor. So in the bottom of the skip, we have logs and wood chip. And as Amy is saying, we have yummy wormies coming in. Yeah. The top. Um, then there's a mixture of soil and compost gone in there. So it's it, it actually turned into an amazing um, habitat for the plants that oh yeah so this is what it looked like shortly after planting this shortly was um, yeah this was this was shortly after planting we um uh we planted it i think 
it was uh, it was out of we planted out of season uh, this time but um this was maybe a week after planting so it looks we're very proud of this picture because we're it, it's a uh, we did so much work on this skip anyway it's 10 different species of native trees and shrubs um I added some ferns in and some ground cover plants and we mulched it with wood chip but uh, we have had since it's grow. This the next picture is of uh, its growth after only two months of growing. It's it's a full on mini forest. Um, if you see it now, it's uh, because it's not in leaf yet. It mightn't look so impressive, but I say that in two weeks' time it'll be so much bigger again. <clears throat> We've had lots of funny stuff uh, seeding in it. Actually, we had cornflowers growing there. We have um, all year round cornflowers actually, yeah. with, even in winter. Um, we've had uh, there was a um, a butternut squash plant growing in it, which and tomatoes. <laughs> and tomatoes. So we're not really sure how they got there, but it's been it's been an amazing kind of little biodiversity uh, lab as uh, of sorts. And this is our our nursery at the Digital Hub. Uh, the Digital Hub is opposite the Guinness Brewery on James's and uh, on Thomas Street, opposite James's Gate. Um, and they, as I said, they couldn't give us access to ground, but they could give us some outdoor space. And this is beside a coffee place. So it's in a very public place. And all these very young trees are um, are sitting in these uh, nursery beds, which are uh, their air pruning beds. So the roots don't get too, um, conde they don't get too cramped in them, um, but they've never been touched. There's never been any vandalism. And actually when we're there, we find that we have the best conversations with people if we go to water or do any maintenance. We invariably have a great chat with somebody um, and somebody who might be very much city based person, but always has some story about a parent or grandparent and their connection to trees. So we don't have to look very far to, to the connection to trees. Um, this is our because it's tree week. <laughs> yeah, we we've been making some videos at the Digital Hub to try and get some fun into the idea of native trees. So if you bear with us, it's only a minute long, but we'll play that for you now. <laughs> very very i know you're all very excited i know everyone's sold on the idea <laughs> um so how do you make a poplar forest well we help you choose the site um because there's a few things that we need to look at when choosing a site um builder's rubble is what is one of the um main concerns and then overhead wires etc so we will help you um pick the correct site uh, and then we would design the shape, whether depending on what size that you decide uh, a pocket forest is that you want. Um, and then <clears throat> very importantly, we do 50% of our work is with the soil and then 50% is with the trees and the shrubs. So we prepare the soil where we're always walking alongside the community that we're, we're with and the soil is a no dig method so um, anyone from four to 94 can participate in that process um, we also we introduce um, the idea of a circular economy and we talk about how important the soil is and the role that the soil um, plays in keeping our trees and our plants healthy as well as ourselves and then we after we've left the soil to come back to life then we come back and we plant the trees and sow some native wildflowers. This is an example of a site design this is what we did have done for a school so where we created a horseshoe size uh, a horseshoe shaped um, a site where there would be an, in a an outdoor classroom in the middle of it um, it's important that the sites that we work with are, are free of underground pipes, uh, overhead wires, and that we steer 
clear of, of existing trees and vegetation as to not disturb the biodiversity that's already there. Um, we also are uh, cautious of, of the fact that there's lots of underground kind of builders rubble under grass. It might look like a, a, a fine site, but once you stick a, a spade in it, it won't go in because it's covered in, in rubble and uh, hardcore underneath. So this is a, a garden in Carlo uh, in Tullo, and actually that was one where we, we came across that rubble in, in a large way. It looks like a perfect lawn and then about a half spade down, there's there's quite a lot of builders um, remains left that should have gone to landfill. Um, but you can see what happens. That's just one growing season with wildflowers, um, trees and shrubs, and they would have gone in some of them at half the size they grow to in the first season because once we give the soil the treatment that we give it and then let it rest, the roots are very happy there and they grow extremely well and extremely quickly. Uh, so it's a nice uh, tree plant from a tree planting point of view, uh, people see results very quickly, which can be very satisfying. This is uh, Warren Mount again. This is the first site we did. And as you can see, it was a very dark and forgotten site. Um, it was smack bang in the pandemic. So we were, we weren't able to be with the students, um, but they worked very hard to clear all that rubble and pebbles and stuff that you can see in that before photo. Um, and then we um, then we prepared the soil and, and planted while doing online uh, presentation with the students. And you can see the difference in, si in the size. Sorry, go on. Um, so when we say soil preparation, um, effectively what we're trying to do is recreate uh, or, or create as much as we can um, a forest floor for the young trees, because obviously that's the place where young trees are going to grow the best. Um, so we're adding in things like woody material, because that's what a forest does. If a branch falls, it's, nobody picks it up and it becomes part of the forest system. Uh, we're trying to stop the grass from growing without digging it out or spraying it or doing any of the other methods used to stop grass growing. So we're using cardboard to, to block out the light. Um, you'll see here, if I can get it to work, um, I speed it up. Yeah, there we go, the time lapse. Um, this is, <laughs> and what, what Ash is doing there with the fork is just aerating things. So we're not disturbing too much. We're just trying to add more. And we're adding more air, we're adding more life. Uh, we're putting in lots of worms and compost materials and wood. Um, I, I wish it was always this fast and easy. <laughs> um, and we like to use things that are in a uh, space. So this garden, they had lots of grass cuttings and uh, things like that. This, this video ends before the final stage, which would have been cardboarding and keeping everything um, out. And then it makes for a completely different place when you go back to it to plant the trees, which is, has been so fascinating for us to, to see and do. So our soil preparation happens uh, generally after the summer, so between September and, um, and October. And then we, we come back in uh, late December or preferably January or February um, in bare root season, which is when the trees are asleep. And then we plant um, and then we let the trees uh, uh, settle in. It's best to transport trees when, and, and move them, transplant them when they're asleep. So you don't uh, unnecessarily stress them um, <clears throat> and they won't fail. So um, we only use uh, Irish native trees and we aim to use only Irish grown trees. And with uh, our nursery spaces, we um, are trying to also grow from seed ourselves, which we're only new, uh, in uh, two years. So it's not, we haven't grown that many trees ourselves, but that's our aim in our long-term planning. Um, the trees are chosen to that they can be pruned. If you want to keep your forest kind of not too tall, then you can, uh, they can be pruned um, in the first number of years to, uh, after planting. So we can kind of force them to stay a little bit smaller than, than normal. And that's detailed in, where did our planting guide go? Hmm. I think you have to unclick that first. Well, how do I the do red that? button. Can you go there? Oh, yeah. There we go. Why is it not oh. doing that? Oh, oh, we hit another. <laughs> we have another <laughs> stumbling block. Oh, there's okay. Book. okay, well, we'll just keep going because yeah. We're... So we have a planting guide, um, which we give to people a booklet and a poster. And um, you might be able to see it behind Amy's head there, which gives all the it's a local artist, Ina Farrell, who does wonderful drawings. And she's actually drawn the trees at a very young stage with their root balls, which we don't normally see when we when we see pictures of trees. Um, and we have all the information there. If you need to, the, the species for that smallest footprint are chosen specifically to be suitable for pruning so they can be kept to a, a smaller size. Uh, or if there's more space, the trees and, and shrubs can be allowed to do their thing and grow uh, 
as fast as they can. So this ends with a um, just a little thank you to you that I think they were that was nearly our second last slide. Yep. Thanks to Jeanette for setting it up and we'll send on contact details to Jeanette and we can take questions, but I think we might have to start another Zoom meeting to do that because um, I'm on a we have eight minutes. We've got eight minutes, eight minutes for questions. Does anybody have a question? Okay. I have a quick question. Yeah, girls, I suppose. Look, and I suppose we're conscious it's National Tree Week as well. And this year, like say in Carlow County Council, we give out 500 native Irish saplings. And do you think like that the biggest problem in terms of planting the saplings is the ground preparation that people are inclined to plant them and hope they grow? Like, or, or are there any shortcuts even in terms of, of getting your, your soil right when you want to plant the likes of the varied saplings? I think um, it, part of me says there's no bad way to plant a tree because we need to plant so many more trees. But at the same time, a sapling planted on its own without any other trees around it is it's not what a natural forest would do. No, there is no oh. there's no such thing as a lone tree in nature. So if you do get saplings, I, I mean, the, the diversity of those saplings is interesting as well, because if you've got way more diversity, those trees are going to cooperate with each other much more. Um, yeah, and be much more healthy and provide much more habitat for many more species as well. So, yeah, soil preparation is is a large part of it because often and and putting the tree or trees in in a place where they're going to become part. I suppose just planting a tree and then walking away from it. It's I mean, it's I love planting a tree. I love planting trees. But I think if you're investing time into trying to figure out what it is that a forest does, as opposed to just a lone tree, and then mm. that opens up. I mean, what? this presentation is all about how we make pocket forests but actually what we're discovering from feedback people we worked with is that pocket forest makes all kinds of other things happen in the community as well so people start to think about composting and they start to think about maybe um, applying some of the same principles in their own garden where they maybe they don't have an area of lawn that they're going to mow all the time that they can actually just card sheet, sheet cardboard it and start to grow vegetables or start to have you know a little uh, fruit forest or something like that so mm -hmm. um yeah I, I love tree planting I love national tree week I love people talking about trees but I think we can do way more with it and that's what we love to do as pocket forests because it, it opens up all kinds of solutions to uh, the problems that we're facing in in terms yeah. of uh you know biodiversity loss in terms of what we do with our food waste how we connect with each other how we reconnect with nature how we bring nature into towns and cities where most people live now knowing that a lot of what we have to do with forests and planting are going to be huge scale and they're going to be you know oh. they're necessarily going to be large forests um, but those are in remote areas that most people don't see so that's what again what we love about this project that we bring that to your neighborhood and your doorstep so yeah brilliant plant a tree but better still plant a forest brilliant yeah no no absolutely you're, you're singing yeah. i think most people's language here I think yeah. Justin has his hand up there. Yeah, uh, hi, Catherine, and the rest of the gang there. That was brilliant. Uh, a quick question for you. If the community wanted to get you guys in to help start off the pocket first, is there much of a waiting list there, or a time lag before you, you'd get we're, to us? We're at the, we're at the, it's nature that sets the time for us. So we're just at the end of planting season and berry season has been so short because of the warm oh. autumn. And now we're having this yeah. incredibly yeah. warm spring. So at the end of, really at the end of this week, we're at, we're done and we're out in, with planting. And then the next stage would be soil preparation, which could start in the summertime. Um, and then planting again in December, probably. So okay. um, anybody who wants to get in touch, please do get in touch because we've lots of, we've delighted to work with people and, you know, it's not, we are extremely busy at the moment, but, uh, you know, we're, we're then lining up next, our next projects, if you like. I'd just like to say okay. with, with the soil, yeah. with the soil preparation stage, the longer you can leave it, the better. So if that happens um, at the beginning of summer, then that's fine if, you are, if it's a site where it's happy to be left. Because, um, you know, that, that is our unique uh, selling point. In fact, is that we put as much emphasis on, on what's beneath our feet as what's above it. So yeah. um, but that kind of extends the, the time frame a little bit for us. Brilliant. Okay, thanks guys. I'll, I'll thanks, be in touch. <laughs> Jeanette, are you? I, oh, sorry. I don't know here. Okay. Um, Kim just wants to know: Can you put up contact details in regards to chat on creating a forest? Of course. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, so but just Jeanette, put your... We might be running out of time. Just in case we, we don't have uh, enough time, we can, we are, we'd like to send an email to every, every participant tonight with all our contact details and our social media information, just so you, everyone has it at hand and they can then use our email address to contact us. Yeah, well, what I can do then is even I can capture all of the stuff as well from teams, so the people that didn't get across. Yeah. So even yeah. if you want to send it on to me and what I'll do then is I'll send it out to everybody else on Teams as well. Great. Just to right. say, look, at apologies for technical issues and whatever else and that we can get it, get it, get everybody going and get everybody growing as well. Great. Right. That'd be great. Just when you were talking about the GA club, people might not be aware in their local area that the national GA body have a green, yeah. uh, a green clubs initiative. So to talk to your own local club about what they're doing. All of our local GA clubs, Hurling and Camogie clubs are being encouraged now by the GA in Ireland to get involved in terms of climate action. Mm -hmm. Other things as well to think about is um, the local agenda 21 funding through the county councils, which is now the Community Environment Action Fund. It hasn't been announced yet, but we believe that is coming back. So talk to your local authority, to your environment department, or your environmental awareness officer about that, and they can put you on a list to let you know, because then we can help you and local authorities support you to work with people like the lovely ladies in bringing especially urban forests to your areas. Brilliant. I see some other hands raised there. I'm not sure if I can let them in or... Yes. Could, yeah. could I ask a question? Yes. Um, basically, I live in an estate and um, we have a huge open space area. Mm -hmm. And if I got on to the local council, would they support a forest, um, you know, a little pocket forest maybe in, in the green space? Yeah, we've worked with one uh, similar open space in a, an estate in Swords where we put in two separate 50 square meter forests and it's worked really well. We just visited it yesterday to see it growing in its first season because it was one of our earliest plantings. We planted it back at the end of November and it's it's really taken off and every every tree is doing really well. So that they're perfect spaces and I think it's a, a wonderful community <laughs> amenity then that you can create in that space. Um, and would the council provide the funding or would we have to go through um it's a, you know it's somebody a mix. we found it's a mix so we have some funding from organizations like changex um and we have some funding from the woodland support fund from the department of agriculture but we're delighted to work with with local authorities as well if they have funding um we can we can every every um project that we work on comes with a different funding mm. model typically yes and does it require much maintenance? You know, if the council weren't prepared to maintain it, could, um, you bit, know, would you have, there's a little would bit you have to take it on board yourself as a resident of the estate to look after it? Or would the council take it over? Or what, it, what it, would be the long term it, for the maintenance? Yeah, again, it can be worked out. I think it's very nice for somebody to, be, to become a forest keeper or for a group of people to become a forest keeper. And then it's a little bit of litter picking if there's something growing on the ground that you don't will like the look of to put some more cardboard and mulch on top of that. Um, a lot of them will, you know, there's buttercups and docks and things will come in, which we'd be very happy to see. But if you're not, there are ways of dealing with that. So again, it can be worked out on a case by case basis. But the ideal model is that, that there's a forest keeper who looks after it. <laughs>